Hello everyone, welcome back to yet another Nitro Beer Game of the Year Roundup, once again brought to you via the estimable Imran Khan. Well, okay, it's actually brought to you by all of our Nitro Beer hosts, but since Imran is the guy who actually produces my videos, Imran gets top billing. And hopefully this year he won't molest my videos, which will be helpful when I reveal my Game of the Year is still Bioshock Infinite. When I put together this list, I was firmly convinced 2014 was one of the weakest gaming years in recent memory. Aside from a perceived lack of quality big budget software, it seemed like this was the year that everything fell apart. The gaming community revealing new levels of utter depravity to publishers outright releasing unfinished and nigh unplayable games, 2014 seemed like a disaster. And while 2014 certainly wasn't a strong year, it wound up being better than I feared at first, at least in quality of games, if not quality of humanity or quality control. It was definitely weaker than last year's Murderer's Row of Game of the Year worthy AAA titles, but I felt like 2014 had a larger breadth of games. 2014 gave us an unmatched retro revival, stretching from faithful reproductions like Shovel Knight to pixel art originals like Broforce. You want to return to classic PC grognard gaming goodness? Well, 2014 gave us the Divinity, Original Sin, Elite Dangerous, Wasteland 2, and Sid Meier's Beyond Earth. You want to return to quality survival horror? We had the Alien Isolation, The Evil Within, Sir You Are Being Hunted, and Five Nights at Freddy's. You want fighting games? We had... Uh... We had Smash Brothers? Okay, look, it wasn't a strong year for every genre. But we had so many great games this year that I wasn't able to fit them all into our list. Here's a sampling of some that for whatever reason did not make the cut. Number one, Dragon Age Inquisition. Now, I'm confident that if Dragon Age Inquisition had come out a month earlier, it would have made the list quite easily. But we're talking about a beefy 80 hour plus PC RPG epic. I simply didn't have the time to give it its due before the end of the year. Sorry, Dan. 2 and 3, Alien Isolation and The Evil Within. Cut for the same reason. Uh, released too close to Bayonetta 2. Sorry guys, if Bayonetta 2 came out, I'm not playing anything else for the entire month. And by that point, what's the point of playing those two games for full price? <laughs> See you next Steam Cell. 4 through 6. Watch Dogs. <laughs> Just kidding. Watch Dogs was never going to make this list. Uh, you too, Assassin's Creed Unity. And also Far Cry 4, uh, but not because of Ubisoft's stunning winter of incompetence. I just didn't have time for you this year. Number 7. Mario Kart 8. I don't play Mario Kart games. Number 8. Akiba's Trip. Undead and Undressed. Actually, I'd listen to this just to see if Emerald would actually find video for it. I trust that he won't, but he's a professional dude. Number 9, The Walking Dead Season 2. Uh, between this, The Wolf Among Us, and Tales of the Borderlands, I'm not even sure if Walking Dead was the most important Telltale game released this year, and damned if I'm going to be bothered to find out. Number 10, Five Nights at Freddy's. Uh, honestly, I forgot this existed until five minutes ago. Uh, remember, above all else, that I am a awful human being. On with the list. Number 10, Mercenary Kings. Look, sometimes I like the idea of a video game more than I like the game itself. Mercenary Kings presents us with the idea of an infinitely large version of Metal Slug, and combined with Paul Robertson's immaculate sprite work, that should be the greatest thing in the world. And for the first hour, Mercenary Kings lives up to that promise. Uh, then you realize that there's only really one map with three basic missions, and the basic run and gun gameplay is off just enough to make you wish you were playing Metal Slug instead. Mercenary Kings also illustrates the importance of level design. Metal Slug and Counter work because they elevated enemy placement to an art form. Mercenary Kings has a bad habit of placing enemies in unfairly difficult to, to reach locations, or areas where you can easily exploit projectile ballistics to engage an enemy unharmed. It's a small thing, but it's infuriating once you notice it, and it would not be an issue if the developers had actually paid homage to Japanese game design rather than just ape it. This is an important distinction when we get to Shovel Knight later in the list. Number 9. Bravely Default there are a lot of homages and revivals this year, uh, ranging from Shinji Mikami's homage to his own Resident Evil franchise, to Geometry War 3's homage to Geometry Wars 2, to Watch Dogs' homage to pure fucking garbage. Here, we have Square giving homage to its own 16-bit JRPG legacy. And while it is impossible to live up to the legacy of SNES Final Fantasy or Chrono Trigger, Bravely Default makes a game attempt at it. 
characterizations are spot on, the artwork is gorgeous, and the dialogue noticeably improved from spotty 16-bit translations. Bravely Default is utterly charming, and I wish I loved it more. But the, sp the pacing is spotty, the combat is lackluster, and some of the overall base missions are downright infuriating. I gave up on Bravely Default far too early and intend to revisit it one day, but sadly it could not capture me in the same way as the best Genesis or SNES RPGs. That's probably not this game's fault though. Number 8. Shovel Knight The difference between Shovel Knight and Mercenary Kings is the difference between a developer trying to ape a genre and a developer trying to painstakingly recreate a genre from the ground up. Shovel Knight is a love letter to 8-bit platforms, and if you grew up with an appreciation for a very specific type of Capcom inspired platformer, then Shovel Knight is amazing. If not, then you're not going to get a whole lot out of it. Shovel Knight is another one of those games I'm in love with the concept more than the actual end product, but unlike Mercenary Kings, that failing is entirely in my own tastes, not in the game itself. Shovel Knight is a little too difficult and unforgiving, but I still respect the game, and I am enamored with the idea of the digital archaeology of a NES game. As a Sega guy, I don't feel jealous as much as I feel cheated. Why couldn't someone care this much about Kid Chameleon as they did DuckTales? Number 7. Wolfenstein The New Order Bar none, Wolfenstein presents the best level design of the year and is the most enjoyable first-person shooter I've played since Metro 2033. These guys are formerly Starbreeze, and they're the people who brought us Escape from Butcher Bay, and it shows. Levels are dark and atmospheric, stealth and strategy is a necessity, the levels are impeccably laid out, and every enemy encounter is something you need to plan out ahead of time. A far cry from Wolfenstein's it-inspired arcadey roots. Sadly, these guys couldn't quite bring everything together. Gameplay is impeccable, but the scaffolding surrounded that gameplay is uneven and at times downright baffling. It seems like this developer was going for some sort of Spec Ops the Line mind fuckery, uh, but they never really go through with it all the way. We never know if there's anything more to BJ's brain damage. His relationship with Anya has all the subtlety of a Templar fanfic, and the game literally ends with a giant mech boss fight. But I want to stress that those complaints are relatively minor. If you're only interested in Wolfenstein to see Starbreeze's return to form, then absolutely play this video game. Just don't try to think too much into it. Number 6. Shadows of Mordor There is roughly a 4 hour stretch of Shadows of Mordor, where I swore it was the best game I've played all year. The combat was as smooth as Arkham, the traversal the equal of Assassin's Creed, and the base infiltration every bit as fun as Far Cry 3. The Nemesis system is easily the most interesting new twist the gaming to come along in years, presenting an evolving and challenging roster of enemies that can show up at any time to wreck the player's best laid plans, and forcing you to change your strategies on the fly. The game is a beautiful marvel of the 3D coder's art, and the writing, uh, well it's not the best Tolkien you've ever read, but it doesn't embarrass itself either. So what happened to keep Mordor out of my top 5? Well, the 4 hours before and the 4 hours after the 4 hours in the middle happened. Early in Mordor, you don't really have a lot of abilities for combat. As a result, combat isn't interesting or fully free form. You're fragile, and fights feel like a slog. You do more running away than throwing down, and the appearance of a nemesis orc means you probably have to disengage from the entire area. Meanwhile, late game Mordor turns your character into an unstoppable whirlwind of retribution, handing out multiple single button executions every time you land more than three hits during a combo, able to wade through 50 or more enemies at once, and even the nemesis arcs are but a minor road bump in your path of carnage, a mere bit of slightly tougher gristle in your 84 ounce murder stick. What's worse, Mordor actively punishes you for enjoying the game. The more you explore and the more stuff you collect, the more experience you gain, and the skill points you accrue, meaning that very narrow window of superb gameplay narrows all the quicker. And there are other lesser issues. The second half of the game is basically a lush jungle mirror of the first. Environments feel basically the same through the entire game, and what feels like major storyline reveals are completely lost on people who are not heavily into Tolkien lore. But man, these middle floor hours are fucking beautiful. Transistor now this is the part where I have to find something to justify placing Transistor in my top 5. The problem is I can't, but I'm also not going to drop it down. It's sort of the opposite problem of Shovel Knight, where I was enamored with a game rather than its execution. Okay, so Transistor is not as good as Bastion. 
few games are, but as easily as Beautiful as Bastion, it has a better story and a better universe. It's not as charming as Bastion, but it's not as emotionally manipulative either. Transistor feels more sophisticated and adult. It's what Bastion would be if Supergiant were as badly tugging on the Pixar heartstrings. The gameplay, well, Bastion worked because it was Diablo. It was Diablo with dedicated level design and enemy placement, but it was basically Diablo. Transistor tries to be more than that. It's a hybrid of SRPG planning with action RPG reflexes, and while it never really brings both together into a smooth mesh, it's also a unique combination. Transistor gameplay feels like you're programming in a long string of commands. Sometimes this works out amazingly well, and you feel like a golden video game god. Other times it falls flat and you wind up completely whiffing your turn. A lot of this is due to Transistor's freeform nature. There's thousands of different loadouts you can program red with, and some of those work better than none of others. If it sounds like I'm going out of my way to defend Transistor and its placement on my list, well, I am. The fact of the matter is, I fell in love with Transistor in a way I have few games this year, and love can always be rationalized. Number 4. Broforce. There's two ways to handle a retro revival. You can either pay homage to a genre, or use pixel art in conjunction with modern gameplay design to create something totally brand new. That's what Broforce gives us, a new type of game that feels intimately familiar. At first, Broforce seems like a mere trifle of a video game. Run to the right, shoot dudes until you reach the goal. But soon you're faced with a randomized roster of playable heroes with starkly different abilities and level design that is both highly crafted and free form. Most every tile in the game is in some way destructible, allowing the player to carve a carnage filled tunnel to either cleverly cheat an entire level or simply watch stuff explode real big. Brute Force feels initially limited, but it fills out a lot of ideas with its simple run and gun gameplay. From zipline heroics to riding atop flaming propane tanks to undermining an entire enemy base and watching its inhabitants fall into a gore pilled fit of doom below. Each of its two dozen characters could easily be fleshed out into their own retro style video game. And to add in superb sprite work and a constant drip feed of new content, and Bro Force isn't just one of the best games of the year, I can honestly say it's one of the best games you will ever play. Number 3 Dark Souls 2. Dark Souls 2 presents an interesting problem. It's not as atmospheric or as interesting or as clever as Dark Souls 1, but it's probably the better pure video game. Dark Souls 1 had the best ideas, but Dark Souls 2 is a better refinement of the core concept. It's sort of like the difference between Bioshock 1 and Bioshock 2, provided Bioshock 2 wasn't an unnecessary soul-crushing cash-in. Along those same lines, Dark Souls 1 is the one fans would prefer to play. Ultimately, Dark Souls 2 feels like more Dark Souls, but it turns out more Dark Souls is just fine and worthy of the list. Consider this a course correction for 2011. Dark Souls should have been in that year's top 3, and here it is now. Number 2. Hearthstone if Game of the Year were decided entirely on sheer numbers of hours lost, Hearthstone would far and away be my winner. Okay, that's a lie. It would be Skyrim again, uh, but work with me here. Like a lot of Blizzard games, Hearthstone isn't the first in this genre, but it's the first to get that genre right. Wizards of the Coast should issue a long litter of apology to Hasbro stockholders for not making a streamlined version of Magic the Gathering before now. Hearthstone is one of the few online competitive games I enjoy playing outside of Street Fighter 2, and like Street Fighter, it is a game I enjoy watching as much as playing, and a game I intensely want to be better at. Like Street Fighter 2, it is easy to imagine Hearthstone is something that will last for years beyond the original release. Even if it doesn't, the genre is now established. Sooner or later, something else will come along to fill that void and slowly bankrupt me one booster back at a time. Speaking of which, does Hearthstone represent the worst elements of pay-to-win versus free-to-play? Sure, but it's important to think of Hearthstone as a card game above anything else, and... Well, sounds cynical, but card games cost money. Magic the Gathering was far more abusive in its own subscription method. As of now, there are only two expansions per year, and at least there is a path to free golden card packs, even if it is relatively slow. Right now, competitive gaming is defined by clicks per second, headshots, and peoning stupid noobs who won't stop feeding the other team. Hearthstone represents a path away from that macho bullshit echo chamber, and we'd be a better culture for it. Number 1. Bayonetta 2 Of course it's Bayonetta 2. 
I knew that, you knew that, let's get it over with. Bayonetta 2 is the best character action game of all time. It has the best combat of all time, and is the ultimate refinement of Platinum Studios art, which is a good thing, as it's probably the last Bayonetta we're going to get for a long while. To that end, Nintendo deserves our eternal gratitude and respect. Without Nintendo inexplicably footing the bill for Bayonetta's two mix of stripper magic and creative violence, it would never have seen the light of day. Comparisons to Bayonetta 1 are inevitable and unfair to both games. Sure, Bayonetta 2 lacks the splash and spectacle of Bayonetta 1, but it is also a more confident, sophisticated effort. Bayonetta 2 is as responsive as ever. Every movement on screen feels like a manifest will of the player. Every combat encounter feels expertly crafted. Far too often in character action games, it feels like you're just presented with a random collection of enemy mooks. In Bayonetta 2, each opponent must be approached with a different strategy. Every fight is a dance, dictated by laws governing their enemy's defeat. When played correctly, Bayonetta 2 invites the zone like few games before it, encouraging a higher level of play every time you pick it up. Bayonetta 2 isn't just a game you play through to see to the end, it's a game you've played for years. It is the rarest of things in our current environment. Bayonetta 2 is a triple A game you play for the sheer joy of playing it. Bayonetta 2 is a game every hardcore gamer absolutely needs to play. Not only is it the finest game Platinum has yet to put out, it may well be the greatest type of its genre that will ever be made. So what will 2015 bring? Well, for me personally, it's going to bring PlayStation 4 because holy crap did Sony win hard. But for everyone, we're going to get Just Cause 3, we're going to get Bloodborne, Witcher 3, Dying Light, Hyper Light Drifter, and that's just a sampling of what should be an amazing year. And who knows, maybe No Man's Sky won't suck. As a culture, we're going to need help, but I think we're getting there. Anita Sarkeesian and others are opening up discussion that would have been uncomfortably laughed at around only a couple years ago. If we learned anything in 2014, it's that there are a great many people out there who want better for us and want us to be a better culture. They need our voice and they deserve our help. A lot of things went wrong this year, but we can begin to make it right again. I have that hope. I also have this sweet new Zoolock deck I copied from Tempo Storm to try out. See you guys next year.